All right, so let's prove the first uh, important theorem about uniformly Cauchy, well, the, the main important theorem about uniformly Cauchy sequences that we'll prove in this section, because there's going to be other stuff besides uniformly Cauchy sequences. Um, well, I guess it's all kind of built on the concept of un uniformly Cauchy sequences of functions. But anyway, so this is the first important theorem about it. So uh, the theorem is just that uniformly Cauchy sequences converge uniformly, as the title here says. Let me just state it. So this is theorem 25.4. So let Fn be a sequence of functions on that's uniformly Cauchy, uniformly Cauchy on some subset S of R. Then there exists a function f on S such that fn converges to f uniformly on S. Okay. All right. So um, the nice thing about this actually is that unlike in the situation of uh, showing, if you remember when we showed Cauchy sequences of numbers converged, that involved some a little bit of like um, trickery. I think at, at some point we ended up having to use some kind of a, oh, well, yeah, we ended up having to use completeness somewhere. Probably there was some substance imps involved. But in this case, actually, we can find the, we can like find the limit of the function, not like explicitly, but we can argue that the limit, that the limit exists at least point-wise just by invoking like the fact that this sequence is point-wise Cauchy. So we, and we already know that Cauchy sequences of numbers converge. So we're kind of like using what we already know about Ca Cauchy sequences of numbers to get a lot of stuff for free. But then we still have to show that this converges uniformly to the limit. So the first part of this is, um, so the first part is like, we find the limit point-wise first for any x in S, fn of x is a Cauchy sequence. Right. This is just because obviously if, so, you know, so um, if epsilon is greater than zero, there exists a capital N such that for all N and M greater than, uh, or let's say, let's call this one X naught, uh, for all N and M greater than capital N and for all X and S, uh, we have absolute value of fn of x minus fm of x is less than epsilon. In particular, for all n and m greater than n, we have absolute value of fn of x naught minus fm of x naught is less than epsilon. Right. So I'm just this. The whole point of this parenthetical statement here is just to convince you that. The uniformly Cauchy criterion implies the point like pointwise Cauchy criterion, right? I mean, it makes sense. It's just a stronger version of that. Um, if we can choose a single capital N for all the values of X and S, then we can definitely choose a capital N for a single value of X, right? Like this X naught or whatever that we're paying, that we're like fixing our attention on. We can just choose capital N that works for all X's and then that'll, that'll work for X naught too, right? So Fn of X naught is always a Cauchy sequence for any particular X naught. Um, so for any X in S, Fn of X converges. Define F on S by F of X equals the limit as N approaches infinity of fn of x, okay? So we're just defining the limit to be the pointwise limit because that way we actually have access to the limit function. We can talk about it and we can say, and we can do stuff with it, right? Um, even though like in the end, right? In the end, we, we expect that not only will fn converge to f pointwise, it actually converges uh, 
uniformly, which is of course what we're about to try to show, we can still like define f of x just by taking the pointwise limit because if fn is going to converge uniformly, then it sh then it has to converge at least pointwise. So uh, taking the pointwise limit will actually give us the function, and then we can, can then we can prove that fn converges uniformly to that function. Okay, so we claim fn converges to f uniformly on s. So we let epsilon be greater than zero. Then since fn is uniformly Cauchy, uh, we can find capital N such that for all n and m greater than capital N and for all x and s, we have absolute value of fn of x minus absolute value of fm of x is less than epsilon over two. Okay, if we consider n fixed, but let m tend to infinity in this inequality, we find that, right, so basically, if you consider this as a sequence in M, like a sequence, like, you know, a, a sequence depending on the index M only, right? Let me write this a little bit better, right? You just let M change. So M, you know, M starts at capital N, let's say, and then, it, you know, you go to M plus one, M plus two, M plus three, and so on, and keep N constant, right? then you get a sequence that way. And since this is true, this inequality is true for every value of, of little m, then when you take the limit, it becomes an inequality, right? So, or it becomes a, a weak inequality, right? So we find that fn of x, and the limit, the limit of course, right, is just gonna be, since this, this is all continuous, right? This, like, if you think of this, uh, um, what am I trying to say? Uh, these operations that we've done. Well, we've shown we've shown that you can like do these oper. You can pass limits inside, right? So let me write this. So the limit as m approaches infinity of f n of x minus f m of x, right, equals the absolute value of f n of x because this is just constant. F n of x is just a constant, and then minus the limit as m approaches infinity of f m of x, right? And this is f n of x minus f of x. And we just know that we can do this because of those, those are like basic limit theorems, right? That you can pass the limit inside of absolute values is one of the limit theorems from section nine. And then you can like pass it through this difference is another limit theorem from section nine. Um, and then, uh, so then you, you end up with f of x just by definition, and then this is less than or equal to epsilon over two, which is strictly less than epsilon. Note that in this case, the only reason we used epsilon two, uh, epsilon over two was because this was weak. So used because it is less than epsilon. So we just needed anything that was strictly less than epsilon here. Uh, because this inequality ended up being weak, but that way we can still force this strict inequality with the epsilon itself. That's the only reason we use it over two. It's not because of any triangle inequality or anything like that, so don't get tripped up. Okay, so and literally anything less than epsilon would have worked. Uh, so then, right, uh, then what that means is, well, well, this was true, so we're we're not totally done. So remember, this is, this is true for all x and s, and n was arbitrary as well. So it's true for all n greater than capital N as well, okay? So since 
it's true for all x in S and for all n greater than capital N, um, that means Fn goes to F uniformly on S by definition. Okay, so yeah, it's actually a very simple argument. There are technical details like the epsilon over two that honestly, you might be better off just ignoring because <laughs> the main ideas are elsewhere. Um, the main idea is really just this trick of like imagining that n is fixed and then letting m tend to infinity. That's kind of the only, that's the only trick really. So anyway, uh, that's it for this uh, proof. That's it for this video. And in the next one, um, we'll look at a couple examples of applying this in particular to, um, to series, series of functions. All right.